যে ফার্স্ট হচ্ছে যে ওরিয়েন্টেশন ফর দা স্টাডি অফ পোয়েট্রি এন্ড দা মেডিয়েভাল পোয়েট চসা দা সেকেন্ড ওয়ান ইজ আন্ডারটেকিং আ স্টাডি অফ পেন্স স্পেন্সার দ্যাট मींस ইট ইজ অ্যাকচুয়ালি ফোকাসিং অন দা এলিজাবেথান পিরিয়ড মোস্টলি বিকজ ইট ইজ দা টিপিক্যাল দা এলিজাবেথান সনেটিয়ার এডমন্ড স্পেন্সার এন্ড অ্যালং উইথ হিম আই ডোন্ট নো হোয়েদার উই শুড গো উইথ উইলিয়াম শেক্সপিয়ার এন্ড অলসো ফিলিপ সিডনি and the next one is a very interesting one that is the metaphysical poets and as you can know that uh, there is two there are two particular poets that have been mentioned here one is john dan and the second one is harbert um then block 4 is starting milton it's an individual poet actually so starting milton that's why you will get the the, the shorter poems by john milton and also the long poem like paradise lost and along with john milton the the particular formations of the neoclassical writing it actually continues with john dryden and alexander pope actually these are signifying the two different you know uh, two different ages to some extent the first one is the restoration period and the second one is augustan period and there are two major poems that have been taken for consideration here the first one by J- john dryden it is maclick no and the second one is epistle to dr arbutnot by by alexander pope and then there comes the the romantic sections you see that uh, the two blocks they constitute of uh, the romantic poetry the first one is uh, with uh, blake and wordsworth and coleridge and the uh, block 7 there you can get the second generation of romantic poets and that's why there is shelley and keats and then block 8 it is the victorian poetry and that's why there is browning and there is robert browning and dante gabriel rossetti and christiana georgiana rossetti and then there is oscar wilde and then block 9 is the modernist poets and then block 10 some modernist and postmodernist poets and their the specific references have been given to dylan thomas and philip larkin and sylvia plath so now what happens you know that uh, uh, i have as i have constituted i have thought that today i will discuss on the i will discuss on the particular references with uh, the metaphysical poetry that means the the fundamentals of the metaphysicals and then what happens first of all i i need to make a kind of an outline of the poetry in general it is the british poetry as you can know and i don't know uh, how much of the paper has been already been covered and now i need to clarify some of the features of the poetry in general and uh, the historical perspectives that can be associated with the with the british poetry and then i should go with two or three of the sections as you see uh, first of all i will take john dun and there are some poems that are in your syllabus i will i will specifically take two, uh, four or five poems by john dun and then if if the time permits then i will move towards uh, some of the poems by john uh, uh, blake actually william blake so uh, before going to the the particularizations of the poetry in general let us make a kind of an outline of the poetry in general i do not have any particular slide i am prepared for the, for that so uh, let me let me tell you something about the the poetry in general as you know that uh, if you think about poetry that means the english poetry to be specific uh, you will find that the poetry originates uh, much earlier than the prose as we know that in each and every perspectives of poetry whether it is the english poetry or whether it is if you think about the sanskrit and others you will find that the verse form is considered to be mostly important and uh, the earliest version of literature that actually originated that actually was present it is to be considered as the 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 verse sections or verse segmentations so fundamentally if you think about history of literature in general because i have i have i have, uh, I have taken a look in your you know uh, the modules that are in the e content section and i have found that some of the basic sections of your syllabus has been uh, it is actually focusing on the the history part obviously this is the history of english literature and this particular uh, paper that is mg1 as it constitutes the, the poetry section there is the british english poetry section so that's why they are actually focusing on a big basic kind of a outline of poetry okay and uh, what are the chief characteristics of these kinds of poets or their poetry in general and what are the uh, you know the the kind of a lineage you see 
a kind of a lineage has been pointed out different kinds of poets are there different kinds of groups are there different kinds of schools are there so these have been incorporated in 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 your syllabus so that's why i thought that uh, first of all before going to i i don't know whether i will cover all these sections uh, step by step i will get all the classes regarding mg1 but uh, first of all i need to uh, so tell you something about the the outline of english poetry to be specific and as you know that it begins with the old english period i have found that uh, in your paper that is meg 1 paper uh, it actually begins with chaucer okay that means in the year 1400 it actually begins and uh, there is a, the canterbury tales and some of the sections of the canterbury tales are in your syllabus but but before canterbury tales first of all we must think about that there is Uh, a huge branch of uh, literary formations or huge branch a section of poetry that were originated and that was considered as the anglo section poetry as you know because uh, with the anglo section age as most of you are coming from the english honors section so i i i consider that uh, you have some full knowledge about the anglo section period and you have some of the full knowledge is about the anglo section poetry in detail but just i am trying to make a kind of a recapitulation you see that means uh, to make you remember what we have read before in your undergraduate section as we know that anglo saxon period uh, it began with uh, you know specifically it has to be considered as 498 and prior to that there was also the references of the scandinavian formation of poetry uh, but uh, to be specific the anglo saxon period poetry that is anglo saxon poetry Uh, can be divided into three major sections as we know the first group is considered as uh, the anglo saxon heroic poetry as you can find there is the particular sub branch of the heroism or the heroic poetry to be specific then there was the the matter with the anglo saxon uh, christian poetry or that was considered as the anglo saxon uh, you know religious poetry and the religious poetry can also be classified or differentiated into two major sections at one point there is anglo saxon christian poetry at another point there is anglo saxon uh pagan poetry to be specific and the third group that actually constituted in anglo saxon period it was considered as the anglo saxon elegiac poetry probably you have remembered all these things um i i don't know whether uh, these are in your mind or not but uh, probably you have thought something about or you have the full knowledge about beowulf okay do you remember that beowulf mona ache apnader beowulf yes sir yes sir yes yes actually say first p on a jokhon ug section porano hoto tokhon i kintu ekdom prothom diktatei beowulf dei shuru kora hoto normally tai na sei heroism heroic poetry beowulf as an epic or not okay ancient formations of beowulf tai na sei byapar gulo kintu chilo teutonic blood and teutonic yes. tribes and other other things etc okay excellent so what i'm trying to suggest here that means though in your paper okay যদি আপনারা মনে করে থাকেন যে পরবর্তীকালে এর এফ থেকে গিয়ে আপনারা নেট পরীক্ষা দেবেন দ্যাট ইজ ন্যাশনাল এলিজিবিলিটি টেস্ট অর যে আমাদের স্টেটের যে সেট পরীক্ষা দিয়ে দেবেন বা পরবর্তীকালে রিসার্চ এলিজিবিলিটি টেস্ট গুলো দেবেন তাহলে কিন্তু আপনাদের শুধুমাত্র চসার থেকে শুরু করলে চলবে না দো ইট ইজ ইন ইয়োর পেপার দ্যাট দ্য পেপার অ্যাকচুয়ালি বিগিনস উইথ চসার বাট ফান্ডামেন্টালি ইউ नीड टू नो समथिंग अबाउट द एंग्लो सेक्शन हीरोइक पोएट्री एंग्लो सेक्शन एलिजेक पोएट्री एंड आल्सो एंग्लो सेक्शन द क्रिश्चियन पोएट्री অর মেবি দ্য পেগান পোয়েট্রি টু বি স্পেসিফিক আমি সেগুলোকে ডিটেইলিং এ যাচ্ছি না আমি মোটা মোটা একটা আউটলাইন করছি এখানে এন্ড দ্যাটস হোয়াই আই উইল বিগিন উইথ দ্য অ্যাংলো স্যাকশন পিরিয়ড এন্ড আই উইল কাম টু দ্য পোস্ট মডার্ন এজ অবভিয়াসলি আই এম এ কাইন্ড অফ এন আউটলাইন আই উইল টেক ওয়ান আওয়ার বিয়ারলি ফর দিস পার্টিকুলার আউটলাইনিং এন্ড দেন আই উইল মুভ টুয়ার্ডস এনি পার্টিকুলার সাব সাব সেকশন দ্যাট আই হ্যাভ টেকেন ফর ইউ নো ইট ইজ দ্য দ্য মেটাফিজিক্যাল পোয়েট্রি দ্য ফিচারস অফ মেটাফিজিক্যাল পোয়েট্রি এন্ড এন্ড দেন আই উইল মুভ টুয়ার্ডস সাম অফ দ্য পোয়েমস বাই জন ডান সো হোয়াট আই এম ট্রাইং টু সাজেস্ট হিয়ার ইউ নো দ্যাট এট দ্য ভেরি বিগিনিং Uh, after the anglo saxon period there came the anglo norman period that is the middle english period and probably you have uh, in mind that there was considered as the alliterative poems of the anglo saxon of the anglo norman period or the middle english period mone ache apnar the alliterative poetry bole eta part chilo tai na ha sir yes pearl purity patience gown and green knight yes these ah. kinds of things were there right shei gulo kintu alada alada bhabe thakto karon ki bola hoto bolun to je oi মানে কেন এই অ্যালিটারেটিভ পোয়েট্রি বলা হতো জাস্ট বিকজ ইট ওয়াজ কনসিডারড দ্যাট ইন দ্য অ্যাংলো সেকশন পিরিয়ড देयर वाज द প্যাটার্ন অফ পোয়েট্রি টু বি রিটেন বাই দ্য অথরস অর দ্য পোয়েটস দ্যাট ওয়ার অ্যাকচুয়ালি बेस्ड অন দ্য প্যাটার্নস অফ অ্যালিটারেশনস মানে প্রচুর পরিমাণে অ্যালিটারেশন থাকতো কবিতার মধ্যে কিন্তু পরবর্তীকালে সেটা কিন্তু একটু চেঞ্জড হয়ে যায় দ্য মেট্রিক্যাল প্যাটার্নস হ্যাভ বিন ইন্ট্রোডিউসড রাদার 
and that's why you will find that somehow this this particular section this particular pattern of poetry has completely been vanished and then after that <coughs> we find <coughs> sorry <coughs> after that we find that uh, the the typical alliterative poetry actually came into existence and it was considered as the alliterative revival why it is called alliterative revival because once these were present and after that it was vanished and again you will find the revival has been met okay so that's why it's called the alliterative revival to be specific after that there is at one point you will find that the alliterative points are there at another point there are the prose form of writing and the, the prosaisms have been incorporated in terms of the metrical romances that you can find and then there came chaucer and certainly with chaucer that i have to say here with chaucer the basic fundamental design of writing poetry it was completely changed as you can find that there are ample references of chaucer's formations of writing whether it is the canterbury tales a wonderful piece of literature and you can find that there are ample references of the chaucerian you know temperament and chaucerian presentation of the society whether it is the wife of birth still or maybe pardoner still or maybe you know Uh, nance pre still so everywhere you can find that chaucer with the formations of his poetry he is not only focusing mostly on some of the characters or rather it is a kind of an characterization that have to be taken in consideration but at the same time chaucer actually focused on presenting the society with its different aims say for example if we think about uh, you know birth still wife of birth still in in uh, canterbury tales you will find that somehow wife of birth still or in the wife of birth still chaucer is presenting the wife of birth as a, a person completely different from the other you know female characters in a typical society which was completely uh, controlled by patriarchy so in a typical patriarchal society chaucer is writing chaucer is presenting a particular character chaucer is presenting a particular female character who is somehow defying the controlling capacities of the patriarchy that is somehow mostly important why it is important because somehow at the time when chaucer was writing in the year of 1400 or before you will find that chaucer is writing uh, to some extent he is anticipating the concept of new woman that we find in the 20th century so fundamentally when we read chaucer's literature when we read the chaucer's poem Uh, we find that somehow the, the the fundamental focus of of Chaucer's writing is not only to say or present a particular story. It is not simply a story. Rather, the matters of the or the dramatic orientations of the text, or maybe the narratology or the narrative, the, the patterns of narrative, the storytelling methods, and at the same time the presentation of character, the character as representing the class. There is the presentation of society. Each and every perspective perspectives have been taken by Chaucer at that time. Remember, when Chaucer was writing, you cannot find anything that can, that could be associated with the with the formations of new literature. New literature was not there, but Chaucer anticipated that. There lied the the basic temperament of a great genius, you see. And now, when we read Chaucer's writing, when we read Chaucer's poem. we we find that chaucer is generally being considered as the the almost the father of english poetry to be specific you see that after say kidman and kenyol then we come to chaucer and in between we can find some anonymous formations of writings were there so after chaucer you can find that there is a particular age that is called the chaucer to spencer age you see that means from chaucer to spencer and in between there are ample references of you know uh, a huge gap ultimately and there you will find that there are ample references of some poets who are actually focusing on you know a kind of a transformation is to be located a kind of a transformation is to be pointed out and what form of transformation it is the the typical temperamental aspects where the typical formations of latinisms have to be incorporated the differentiations have to have to be present there you know different kinds of influences came at one point when we read the anglo saxon period we find that the the culture that it actually governs the culture that it actually focuses at these are to be considered as scandinavian to be specific the teutonic life the teutonic race has to be preoccupied in the formations of writing poetry when you came to the norman period that is anglo norman period and including chaucer you will find some french temperaments have been incorporated okay these are you know 
I don't want to go to the to that particular extent at this moment. Now, when you think about the particular age that is called the Chaucer to Spencer age, ultimately you will find that somehow the the, the focus has been shifted towards a kind of you know change. The patterning, the, the typical form of Latinism, the typical influence of the Latin literature, these have got changed to some extent. And when we find at the age of Spencer, then you will find that Spencer and you know the broader Elizabethan period, we find that somehow the, the patterning has been incorporated in a different way. What kind of things are there? You will find that Elizabethan period or this particular period, it has to be constituted, it has to be considered as the period of, you know, uh, it is to be constituted as uh, somehow, you know, it's a kind of a lyric poetry that actually predominates. What is lyric poetry? As we know, in the Anglo-Saxon elegiac poetry, you can find that there is also another, another kind of lyricism or lyric poetry to be specific. And now you can find here that uh, fundamentally the Anglo-Saxon lyric poetry, uh, sorry, the, the Elizabethan lyric poetry, it actually focused on mainly on the patternings of writing, you know, uh, sonnets to be specific. And that's why you will find that this particular age, that is the, the Spencerian age, whether it is Spencer, whether it is Philip Sidney, whether it is William Shakespeare and Drayton, everywhere you will find that the writers are mostly, they are focusing on writing lyric poetry and specifically sonnets. And that's why these are considered as the Elizabethan sonneteers, right? So there is, say for example, if you think of Philip Sidney, you will find it is Astrophil and Staler. That is the collection, Philip Sidney's collection. And you will find that somehow what Philip Sidney is incorporating in, in the formations of his poems, you will find that somehow he had got influenced by the typical Petrarch and Sonatier. Not in the presentation, not in the structurations of his poems, but also you will find that somehow uh, Philip Sidney is mostly focusing more on, you know, the presentation of the female character. Okay, it's a kind of an idealized version of the female that Philip Sidney is incorporating here. When you think about Stella, okay, Astrophil and Stella. Stella means the star, and Astrophil is the star lover. So from that particular titling of the of the sonnet sequence that was written by Philip Sidney, you could identify that what is the basic relationship that was being maintained by these two. That means at one point it is Philip Sidney, there is Astrophil, the star lover, and there is the star. So it's a kind of an unreachable perspectives, you see. Okay, that means unattainability, a kind of a distant love is being incorporated. It is not the typical formations of the physical love that Astrophil and Stella is propagating here. Somehow the similar kind of orientation, I'm not going with the sonnet sequences here, okay, at this very moment, because it is not the primary focus of my lecture here. Okay. If, if the time permits or in the future days, if there is a particular section when I will say something about the sonnets, then I will come to that in, in, in a greater form. Apart from Philip Sidney, think about William Shakespeare. It is, it is completely known to you because uh, from the child or you know, school days, you have been introduced with uh, the Shakespearean sonnets, specifically sonnet number 18 and sonnet number 30 probably, or maybe the other sonnets that are famous. And these were introduced in the earlier forms. What I'm trying to suggest here, you see, that uh, in Shakespeare's sonnets, obviously these are some, some, somehow different because the presentation of the female characters is different. You know, Shakespeare was the only person probably who actually devoted his poems, his, the, the section of his poems, to a male person. That means it is not to be found during this particular time period when a male writer is dedicating his poems to a male friend. And the kind of description that Shakespeare made there, it actually, you know, in a modern scenario, in a modern society, it has been pointed out as a kind of a sodomy or sodomite that had been incorporated, homosexuality that had been attached to Shakespeare. But the cultural materialists and the new historicists, they actually oriented this particular formation in a different way. But I'm not going to that. Uh, after Shakespeare, or apart from William Shakespeare and Philip Sidney, there is another particular poet that I have been named here because one particular module has been given to you under the name of Spencer. That is Edmund Spencer. Edmund Spencer had much more talent than Philip Sidney. And that's why you will find that so far as the politics, you know, whether it is social politics or textual politics, I don't know, or, you know, sexual textual politics, it might be there. 
I'm not going to that particular controversy. But ultimately, you will find that somehow, if you think about Edmund Spencer, you will find that Edmund Spencer was a very talented man. And the Spencerian sonnet form, it was altogether different from that of the Shakespeare's. And that's why there you can find the Spencerian sonnets. That's why you will find the, the particular collection that is called Amoretti. That's why you will find the, the particular name, okay, to whom the, the poems were addressed. It was Elizabeth Boyle. And that's why somehow in the modern day, when the cultural materialists or new historicists, they're trying to identify the basic identity of this particular Elizabeth Boyle, we find that this Elizabeth Boyle, it might be possible that Elizabeth Boyle and Queen Elizabeth were the same, one and the same person, but we, we do not have the ample you know, proof to justify our answer or justify our uh, uh, argument. But ultimately, it has been considered by the critics in today's time that this Elizabeth Boyle and, we can, and Queen Elizabeth were the one and the same person. There is a particular group of criticism that actually led to this particular problem. And somehow, when we think about Spencer, we find that uh, the pattern Spencer was originating, the pattern Spencer was writing in, it's again to be considered as the Platonic Love Convention. You know, the, for the particular sonnet, the famous poem that is, uh, you know, the very famous poem that, that have been read by the UG students and also the students that are the school going students, obviously. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. You know, it is in your SSS syllabus. So ultimately, probably you have gone through that particular section also. And you will find that what is going on there, whether it is Philip Sidney, whether it is Edmund Spencer, whether it is Drayton, Daniel Drayton. So everywhere you will find that the sonneteers are focusing mainly on the courtly love tradition, where you can find that you cannot love your beloved and the beloved cannot be your wife. So fundamentally, you will find that when is the matter with the courtly love tradition, we find that somehow the poets are in love with somebody other's wife. Okay, that is the, the significant problem that actually occurs. We don't know whether the, the person to whom it was addressed, she was a maiden or not, but ultimately we can find the courtly love tradition here is a matter of, you know, the impossibilities of sexual consummation. So these are all together present in the Elizabethan poetry. You will find whether it is Philip Sidney, whether it is Edmund Spencer, whether it is William Shakespeare, whether it is Daniel Drayton, everywhere. Shakespeare is obviously you know, unconventional, true, because the presentation of the female characters in the form of the dark lady, as we know, Mary Featon, to be specific, and we find that Mary Featon can be a prostitute. Okay, this has been pointed out, because you will find that the negative aspects have been always being oriented with the dark lady, the, the color is dark, whereas in case of Edmund Spencer, in case of Philip Sidney, you will find the presentation is some, somehow different. Philip Sidney is projecting his beloved to be a, a blonde, as you see, a blondie, to be specific, in, in the typical Bengali pronunciation. For his blonde or blondie, you will find that the golden casket of hairs, the blue eyeballs, the snow white complexion, you see. So ultimately, you will find that somehow the typical formations of a quote unquote goddess that have been attributed to, not Christianity, because in Christianity, there is no particular provision of goddess, but idealized version of the platonic concepts, you see, the pagan concepts, you see, that the Greek goddesses, as you can find, okay, say, Athena or any other forms, you see. So ultimately, you will find if it is Hera or Athena, or maybe in any other form, the Aphrodites. So ultimately, you will find that the presentation of the female characters in its epitomized form, you know, and it is the kind of an eulogizing that have been oriented there, that particular pattern of presentation can be classified, can be found to be present in the formations of the or presentation of the female characters in the sonnets. Whether it is in the work of Drayton or Philip Sidney or Edmund Spencer, each and everywhere, you will find that the patterns of love that have been incorporated, it has been presented as, you know, there is no particular reference of the physicality. It's a platonic love. Why is platonic love? Because it is the idealized version of Plato. Plato considered that. Plato didn't tell us anything about love thing. Plato considered about the ideal and the real. Okay, the real or the ideal is the world of the gods and goddesses. And this particular world is a mimetic world. A, an imitation. The imitation that have been made by you know, God, God has created this world. 
it's some item of mimesis or imitation. So it is not real, it is not ideal rather. So fundamentally, that particular concept that means, uh, you know, a kind of a distance is in between where there is in the ideal or real world, there is the gods and goddesses and in this world there are the admirers or maybe the worshippers. And there is a big gap, a breach in between, between the worshippers and the worshipped. So that's why the unattainability is in between. That particular concept, that very concept has been incorporated in the formation of love. The love of soul or higher love or ethereal love or upper manifestation of love. Different kinds of terms have been incorporated in responding to this particular form of love. So here you will find the patterns of love that actually these poets are incorporating. Whether it is Sydney or Spencer or Drayton or others. That Elizabeth and Sonneteers except William Shakespeare. Shakespeare is also doing, doing that, that in responding to his relations, his feeling for W.H. Henry Rio Thesley or Earl of Southampton. But fundamentally, there is somehow this particular pattern of poetry actually, you know, uh, these were dominating the patterns of poetry in the Elizabethan period, to be specific. Now, whenever we will deal with the Elizabethan poetry, to be specific, we find that these were at the main focus, main crux. Now, after Elizabethan period, you will find that somehow we are moving towards another particular age. And that is, to some extent, the, the first group of transition. Okay, I will, I will take this particular example. As you know, the transitional age, it is being considered as from neoclassical period to romantic period. But there is another particular period where the transition is actually occurring. Okay, this particular period, when you will find it is the, the age of Milton actually. Okay, but at the age of Milton, you will find at the beginning of this particular era, there came the metaphysicals. And that's where you will find the, the poetry, the cavalier poets, you see, the Lovelace and Suckling and others, the, 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 the poets who are actually writing in this particular form, the cavalier form of poetry is there. The Barak poetry is also another form of poetry. You will find them. These have been described as, as a seen there pointed out uh, these are being described not in full detail but in a short span in your modules to be specific your modules are very good for, for that particular form now uh, from that particular section uh, we can find that the other part of literature other part of poetry that have been taken for consideration here it is considered as the uh, the, the metaphysical poetry as I have thought that I will discuss on some of the metaphysical poems, so I will keep that aside, okay? I will come to that later. That is the metaphysicals, what are the metaphysicals, what are the basic orientations of metaphysicals, what does the term actually implicate metaphysical, who is actually coining the particular term, was it something, you know, kind of a praiseworthy term or something like that. So I will come to that later. So apart from the metaphysicals, as you can find, as I mentioned, that this particular age is considered as the Puritan period or the Commonwealth period. These are, you know, so far as the, uh, you know, it, it is the cultural history of England part is there. And uh, fundamentally, you will find that it is, the, it is the reign of Oliver Cromwell. I'm not stating that reign, but uh, because Oliver Cromwell was one among the Republicans. He was not a king. But, you know, what happens, as we know, in a typical Republican country, the the main chair as you can find that he is ruling us just like the king so ultimately everywhere you will find that uh, though it is the name of the republicans are there though the patterns of republicanism is always in work but ultimately we find that the kings and queens are there you see because the power is very problematic we must read michel foucault for that you know, the different kinds of powers the different kinds of orientations of power is always incorporating but ultimately, at the time of Richard Cromwell, we find that Charles I was beheaded and uh, in the year 1641, uh, and then, or 49 probably, I do not remember the exact year. And then what happens that, uh, you know, under the Oliver Cromwell, a republic government was there. And uh, the ministers, one among the famous ones, there you can get uh, John Milton. Milton was uh, under the Lord Protector. So fundamentally, you will find that uh, in this particular time period, it, it actually originates, as you see, this particular age from the Renaissance period, there is a kind of a shift into enlightenment. So this period, this particular age is considered as the enlightenment period or the period of enlightenment. So fundamentally, 
we find that in this particular period was governed by Milton. So now it is the matter with Milton. And as you can find, justifiably, that uh, one of the particular modules of uh, in this particular paper, it has been completely devoted to Milton. So you need to know something about Milton. The most praiseworthy work, okay, on Milton, if you if you want to know about Milton, Milton's temperament, Milton's academic excellence, Milton's biography, Milton's politics, and also the, the merits and demerits of Milton, probably the best work that I could suggest to you, uh, it is written by Samuel Johnson. It is the life of Milton, as you see. I will come to that later. But ultimately, uh, you know, Milton was a Presbyterian, and Milton was also a kind of a person in whom you can find a perfect match of erudition and classicism is being incorporated. So ultimately, if you have to go through Milton, then you must know some 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 patterns of typical formations of Christianity. Typical formations of classical temperaments, typical formations of the society that have been associated with the typical, you know, Latinisms and and at the same time the the Anglicanism and different kinds of religiousic perspectives. You know, it is a Protestant period, so ultimately you will find that the Protestantism is always in work. So fundamentally, what I am trying to suggest here that if you have to go to Milton. You need to classify Milton's academic career into two or three major sections. First of all, Paradise Lost. It is completely different kind of literature. And to go with Paradise Lost, you need to know all the formations of epic poetry. What do we mean by epic poetry? What are the features of epic poetry? What are the formations of epic poetry? What are the types of epic poetry? That is the, the fundamentally we need to know something about that. At one point, there will get the, the first hand epic poetry. And then the literary epic poetry, the traditional epic poetry, and then the secondary epic poetry. So ultimately, you need to classify all these things. If you go through Paradise Lost, the different books are there, as you see, that at some point you have to go through Paradise Lost book one. At some point, you have to go through Paradise Lost book four. So these are some of the important books of Paradise Lost. So fundamentally, you will find that though it is actually being a, a kind of a recreation of, uh, of the tale, that is the archetypal motif or archetypal tale that we find in Bible. But at the same time, you will find the Paradise Lost, or with the help of Paradise Lost, Milton is actually propagating his own ideologies regarding politics. The political standpoint, the political controversies, the political problems that Milton is facing at the time. Different kinds of orientations have been made by Milton during this particular time period through Paradise Lost. Whether it is the matter with Satan and, and God, and you will find that somehow these are altogether different orientations to different kinds of political crises that were present during this particular time period. Somehow these are important, as you can see. I'm not going to Paradise Lost or detail. Okay. At one point, there is Paradise Lost. At another point, you will find that Milton is writing some of the uh, his shorter poems, like Lycidas. Okay. Probably, if you have. I don't know whether it was in your undergraduate syllabus or not. Apart from Lycidas, there are two, two twin poems, that is El Allegro and Il Penzoroso. These are altogether the two, the, the jolly man and the pensive man, the two the states of mind, and also you will find the presentation of the society is altogether present regarding them. At another point, you will get Milton's famous mask, that is Arcadia, not Arc sorry, it's, uh, it's a comus, obviously. And at another point, you will find that apart from Comus, there is also Milton's famous prose that is called the Areopagitica. That is the freedom of press. It was written on freedom of press. And at the same time, you will find that Milton was writing some of the major pamphlets and also some of the major critical essays written on in this particular period. This is the political period, obviously, political essays. These were written by Milton, John Milton there. So if you have to go through Milton, if you have to know something about Milton, I will suggest obviously go through Milton's, uh, Johnson, Samuel Johnson's Life of Milton. There you will get everything about Milton. The positive and negative sides, it's a very good biography that have been written by Dr. Samuel Johnson. After Milton, I must think about uh, the particular age that is called the restoration period. What is restoration period? 
as you can know that uh, the restoration period actually began with the year 1660 it was the abolition of the puritan government or maybe the the commonwealth government to be specific and after this the, the charles ii that is the son of charles i was summoned from france at the time at the time there was louis the 16th in in throne or on throne uh, in france and charles ii was returning from france through dover dover beach and with charles ii there was the restoration of monarchy and at the same time along with the restoration of monarchy there we can find there is a restoration of you know other things you know theaters were closed at the before that and the theaters were reopened and along with that the public performances and other things have been there so restoration period is fundamentally very significant during this particular time period now why i'm stating this particular period to be important because you will find that restoration period uh, is very significant very important for you know cultural history of england altogether restoration of augustan period why because fundamentally you will find that this is the time period when the last of the stewards are actually ruling okay and from the stewards the hanoverian dynasty is coming actually so fundamentally you will find that the basic formations of you know society that have been originated during this time period at one point there is a particular kind of a tussle that is going on between the uh, you know at one point there is protestants and catholics at another point there was the particular reference to whigs and tories the two political parties are there the royalists and anti-royalists the supporters and the opposers so if you go through the history of english literature and also the history of england you will find that restoration period is significant now if you think about this particular period then you will find that each and every period was governed by any particular person any particular author and significantly this particular age the restoration period it was uh, governed by john dryden who was john dryden john dryden was the court poet shabha kobi bangladesh he was the court poet of uh charles ii so significantly there was a particular kind of a crisis that charles ii faced during this particular time period as one particular poem is in your syllabus that is uh, mactechno i must uh, take this particular text to be specifically uh you see that charles ii i, I must tell you something about that charles ii was a voluptuous man you know what is voluptuous and lecherous personality because charles ii had his upbringing at france and you know that there is a particular kind of a difference between the typical english and the french culture you know typical different the different kinds of modesty and you know all the patterns of quote unquote bhadralok these have been associated with the english and these were something missing the courtesy the modesty and gentle manners or gentle activities mannerisms these were the basic patterns of say behavior that have been attributed to the english writers or english personalities if you think about the french on the other hand you will find that french personalities were somehow completely different they loved open sex and violence i don't know whether any person can love violence or not what happens you know that when charles ii actually returned from france the typical orientation got changed you know king and the courtiers they're coming from france with the french taste with the french culture Another thing that is significant, you see, that England, England was a Protestant country till then, and France was a Catholic. So when a person like Charles II and also the courtiers resided in France, returning from France to England, 
okay, resided there say 11 long years of adolescence, most important. And when he is returning to England, he is coming with, okay, he is a Protestant king, but he do not have or doesn't have at the time any, you know, apathy against the Catholics. That's why a particular kind of a clash was there. Now, as I've mentioned that the French tastes were different. When Charles II was returning from France, as I have mentioned that he was a lecherous and voluptuous man, he had illicit relationships with many personalities, many females to be specific. And what happened, you know, Charles II had a number of illegitimate child or children. But that was a kind of an irony for him. He didn't have any legitimate or legitimate child from his legitimate wife. That was the most important irony for Charles II. What happened, you know, that the wife, that is the legal wife, and in England there was a particular custom, it was the rule that the you know kingship or maybe coronation must have to be happened to the legal son. You see, among the illegitimate children, one was Duke of Monmouth. Actually, Charles II had given some some places, some some posts to these, you know, quote unquote sons as rewards. So one of them was the Duke of Monmouth. He was very close to Charles II. But it was the fate, as I mentioned just now, that he was not Charles II's, you know, quote unquote legal son. What happened? There was, and also, uh, as I mentioned, that Charles II had a kind of an affinity for the Catholics. So some of the followers of, you know, Protestantism and also some of the, uh, you know, the oppositions, that is the anti dualist group, they were creating a kind of, uh, a kind of a hardship, a kind of a movement against Charles II at the time. Because there was a particular reference, there was a particular advent that after Charles II, the kingship will be given to James II. Who was James II? Charles II's brother. Now, Charles II was a Protestant. He had an affinity for, you see, uh, Roman Catholicism. But James II was a Catholic person, out and out. That actually created problem. And what happened? Earl of Shaftesbury, there is one among the anti royalists he actually, he had taken Duke of Monmouth into his confidence. And they actually created a kind of a revolt against the king. What happens? Earl of Shaftesbury was imprisoned by Charles II. Earl of Shaftesbury was the leader of the anti royalist group. He was imprisoned. He was charged of, at treason. And that particular thing actually created a kind of a, a problem, a kind of a, you know, the problem within the society and also the political crisis at the time. What happened? After some days, the parliament released that Earl of Shaftesbury and that anti royalist group, they created, they, they actually they structured a medal, a medallion. You see, that particular medallion was placed at the front of a long rally and they just roamed around London with a kind of a moral victory moral victory sign and so so it created problem john dryden who was a court poet and also a very powerful poet 
Charles II asked John Dryden to write a particular poem making a kind of a satire against this particular activity. And John Dryden wrote The Medal. It's a very famous poem, a political poem, obviously. Each and every writing written during this particular time period, it was considered to be a, a very much you know political poem. Nothing is uh, you know something as uh, without without any kind of politics. John Dryden wrote the medal. Now, one particular poet, his name was Thomas Shadwell. He was one among the opposition group. And they actually had given tender to John Dryden, uh, the, this, this man, that is Thomas Shadwell, to criticize, to make a critic of the medal by John Dryden. And then Thomas Shadwell wrote a particular poem that was the, the medal of John Bayes. In place of John Dryden, he wrote John Bayes. And when Thomas Shadwell wrote the medal of John Bayes, then John Dryden wrote another poem. It was a kind of a personal attack. It is called the lampoon. A personal criticism against Thomas Shadwell. And that very poem was Mac Fleckner. That is in your syllabus. It's a very long poem. I have the book with me. And nearly 200 lines are there. Okay. Yes. It is uh, Mac Fleckner by John Dryden. And this is 207 lines. Yes. This, this is the book, actually. So this particular text, that is Mac Flick, no, it's a typical criticism of the writing patterns, the quality of Thomas Shadwell. If you go through this particular poem, you will find that somehow in this particular lampoon, John Dryden has made a direct satire, a direct criticism of the writing patterns of the intellect, different styles that actually uh, used by or employed by Thomas Shadwell and huge formations of criticism that have been made by John Dryden. You see? So ultimately, it's an example of lampoon. It's an also an example of political satire to some extent and also personal satire. Not so much political satire, but ultimately, whenever you will write answers, you need to clarify this particular text in terms of the politics, the story that I have actually told you, you need that particular form. And at the same time, as it was written in the typical restoration period, so it is a restoration part satire, as you can see. That was the fundamental point with which I actually began. That if you think about the evolution of poetry during this particular time period, you will find that somehow this particular text that is John Dryden's Mac Fleckno, it has to be considered as a wonderful specimen of literature that is to be classified as a piece of restoration or satire. The second text that is to be taken in your, in your syllabus, there is a second one that is named as uh, an epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot. It was written by Alexander Pope. After John Dryden, that is the restoration period, there comes the Augustan period. Why this particular age is called Augustan? Because during this particular time period, it's the call, also called the age of enlightenment and age of prose and reason altogether. Because during this time period, you will find it actually flourished to the highest extent. The flourishing forms are always there. In each and every perspective, you will find the flourish is there. So during this particular time period, as I mentioned, that is the Augustan period, you will find that uh, the patterns of writing, it actually flourished so much as it can be related with the, with the period of Augustus Caesar. And that's why this particular period is named as Augustan period. Why it is called Augustan period? Because in the time of Augustus, Augustus Caesar, there was the writers like Virgil, okay? And also Ovid, 
who actually wrote Metamorphosis, and Virgil was the writer of Enid, as you know. So ultimately, this in this particular time period, one particular poet actually excelled in the formations of writing poetry, and he was Alexander Pope. You have gone through one particular poem by Alexander Pope, each and every one. You have the full knowledge about that. There is the rape of the lock. It was in your syllabus. And also, if you are the aspiring student for SSC, the School Service Commission, rape of the lock is in your syllabus. So probably you have the full knowledge about that. In an epistle to Dr. Arbutnot, Alexander Pope is also making a criticism of the, the poet Esters. Who is poet Esther? Poet Esther is considered to be the you know, shorter, the smaller versions of the poets who are pseudo poets, who consider themselves as poets, but ultimately they do not carry that particular temperament within. So it's a kind of an, again, a kind of a satire. So ultimately, these are called the Augustan verse satire. So if you think about the neoclassical period to be specific, one thing I must say here that the neoclassical period is governed with the patterns or governed by the patterns of literature that is considered as the versatires, whether it is the restoration versatire that is uh, completely you know, influenced by John Dryden, or it is the Augustan versatire that is completely influenced by Alexander Pope. So fundamentally, after this particular time period, that is, you know, broader neoclassical period, uh, there, there we can find it's a particular group that is considered as the, uh, you know, it is considered as, to be specific, the age of transition or the age of the pre-romantics. It is called the pre-romanticism or pre-romantic period. And that's where they will get uh, Collins and Thompson and Burns and Blake and others, you see. So here I will stop for some time and uh, I will identify the questions if you have, and then I will move towards our next Blake section actually. Do you have any query? It seems to be a very tiring session, I think. The people are flying actually. And that's why it began with 13 or 14. Now it is 12. At the meantime, there was. No, actually, the problem is with the fatigue level, you see. I think we're stating that it's interesting, but the fatigue level is gradually increasing, as you know. But most of the students, as I've already mentioned, that they consider that as it is the distance medium reading, so we must keep safe distance from studies. So in this particular time period, when they're completely being associated with lethargic forms, you see, now the tiring lectures are always very much problematic for them. I can feel that. OK, you can ask questions. You can use your microphones, obviously. Hello. Any question? Yes. No, sir. Khub tiring mono chena to bata. Abi to continuously bolay achi. Na na sir. Chhe muskil ta achi je. Tiring, interesting laglo lecture ta. I don't know what happens actually. Do you have a question? Do you have a question? I have a very metaphysical question. I have a very metaphysical question. From transition to romantic to Victorian to modern. Do you have a text text? 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 Should I begin then? Yes, sir. Okay. 
যেটা বলেছিলাম আমি যে আমার প্রাইমারি ফোকাস কিন্তু হচ্ছে এখন একটু মেটাফিজিক্যালস দের নিয়ে আমি একটু আদ্য বলি ব্যাপারটাকে নিয়ে যে হোয়াট ডু থিংক অ্যাবাউট দ্য মেটাফিজিক্যালস হু আর দ্য মেটাফিজিক্যালস হোয়াই আর দ্য সো কলড হোয়াট আর দ্য বেসিক রিসার্জেন্সেস টু মেটাফিজিক্যাল পোয়েট্রি অন সো ফান্ডামেন্টালি দ্য ফার্স্ট অফ অল আই মাস্ট সে দ্যাট মেটাফিজিক্যালস ওয়ার দ্য পোয়েটস হু অ্যাকচুয়ালি থট ওয়ান স্টেপ এহেড এজ ইউ ক্যান স্টে that means in the in a particular time period where or when you know the writers like sydney spencer shakespeare they were dominating there came a group of performers a group of poets who actually thought in a different way ekta onno rokom bhabe bhabe jara jodi era ekta porer dike they came later a bit later but ultimately you will find that they were the advanced thinkers okay মানে এর সঙ্গে আমার খুব আমি স্টুডেন্টদের পড়া থেকে আমি বলি যে খুব বেশি মিল পাওয়া যায় আই ডোন্ট নো হোয়েদার ইউ হ্যাভ দ্য এক্সপোজার টু বেঙ্গলি মিউজিক অর নট আমার খুব মনে হয় যে আজকের দিনে যখন বাংলা ব্যান্ডের সব চলে চতুর্দিকে তখন একজন কথা সবাই মনে করে আর কি তার নাম হচ্ছে গৌতম চট্টোপাধ্যায় প্রচুর এগিয়ে কিন্তু মুশকিলটা হয় কি যে ইফ ইউ আর দিফারেন্ট ম্যান ডিফারেন্ট থিঙ্কার ডিফারেন্ট ওরিয়েন্টার আলটিমেটলি কেউ বুঝতে পারে না সেই সময়টাতে তাকে metaphysicals were poet or metaphysical poets i don't know whether i i should use the term metaphysicals or not but ultimately if we make a kind of a classification of the metaphysical poetry and the metaphysical poets i must say that they were of the same category they were a different thinkers the different ways that they metaphysicals the shange to be specific in the modern scenario we can associate the french symbolists and also if we can relate the typical modernists we can relate the metaphysical formations of poetry with him fundamentally what i'm trying to suggest here you will find that metaphysical poets were a group of 17th century poets who were uh, whether or not influenced directly by john donne okay john donne was the main person at that time what happens you know that metaphysicals this particular term this very term was not a very positive term as you see it was coined by dr samuel johnson dr samuel johnson in his discussion on abraham cowley abraham cowley was considered to be one among the metaphysical poets in his discussion on abraham cowley samuel johnson wrote some few lines is at there i'm quoting samuel johnson he wrote it in in life of abraham cowley it was published in uh, lives of poets there samuel johnson wrote i'm quoting metaphysical poets were men of learning and to show learning was their whole endeavor that means they were the intellectuals there is no doubt but the problem is to show learning was their whole endeavor that means their basic intention was to learning ta ke dekhano mane kobita lekhar uddeshyo ra kobita likhto na ora erudition ta ke dekhanor jonno panditto scholarliness eta dekhanor jonno show off korar jonno ora kobita gulo ke form korto ota liklen samuel johnson in his discussion on abraham cowley and at the same time he wrote that in the metaphysical formations of writing the probably you have heard these lines often quotable lines the most heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together that means in the formation of metaphysical poetry the metaphysical poets uh tara ki kore most heterogeneous ideas mane ekdom bishodrish mane samogotriyo noy bishomogotriyo different oi jonno heterogeneous not homogeneous the heterogeneous ideas are yoked yoking as you know কালটিভেশন ক্ষেত্রে এটা ইউজ করা হয় গরুর যে জোয়াল থাকে তাতে ইয়ক করা হয় 
table showing yoking by violence together. So fundamentally, you will find that this particular formation of violence is at the primary focus. They considered that, meta I repeat, metaphysical poets were the main of learning, and to show learning was their whole endeavor. And in the writing of the metaphysical poets, we can find that most heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together. That means they are, Samuel Johnson was with the particular view that metaphysicals, metaphysicals, that means the problem is in their you know connection actual problem ta connection er modhe thik thak bhabe compare jokhon korche jeta amra modern sense of metaphysical conceit boli probably you have heard the name or term shekhane bolche je conceit e ki hoy far fetched simile hoy mane dutu jinisher moddhe jokhon comparison hocche tokhon seta onek beshi far fetched hoy mane koshto kolpito ar ki onek koshto kore bhabte hoy normally seta associated hoy na সেই কারণে metaphysical term টা কিন্তু একটা নেগেটিভ টার্ম টু বি স্পেসিফিক ইট ইজ নট টু বি কনসিডার সামথিং পজিটিভ ইটস আ ডিরোগেটরি টার্ম দ্যাট ওয়াজ ইউজড বাই স্যামুয়েল জনসন ইন হিজ ডিসকাশন অন আব্রাহাম কাউলে লিটারালি হোয়াট ওয়াজ দা ফেট ফর দা মেটাফিজিক্যালস কি হয়েছিল ওদের ক্ষেত্রে টু বি স্পেসিফিক হোয়াট আই হ্যাভ টু সে হিয়ার দ্যাট আই মাস্ট সে দ্যাট আফটার দিস পার্টিকুলার রাইটিং that was written by samuel johnson the fate of metaphysicals was completely doomed as you can see people just stopped reading these poets and what happened it actually last long till 1920s almost mane jokhon metaphysical likhche johnson likhchen dhore newa jak motamoti bhabe oi मेटाफिजिकल তখন কিন্তু মেটাফিজিক্যাল পোয়েটস দেরকে আবার লেখা হয় বা পড়া শুরু হয় আর কি সো টি এস এলিয়টস রাইটিং ইজ অ্যানাদার পায়োনিয়ার এজ ইউ নো আমি যখন যদি সুযোগ পাই টি এস এলিয়টের কিছু পড়ানো তখন বলবো সেগুলো নিয়ে এন্ড আমি জানি না যে আমি তো বলেছিলাম যে যদি আমার ইউটিউব চ্যানেলটা যদি সাবস্ক্রাইব করা থাকে তাহলে টি এস এলিয়ট নিয়ে রিসেন্টলি এখন অনেক কিছু পড়াচ্ছি আর কি আমি যদি ওখানে দেখতে পাবো সো আলটিমেটলি হোয়াট আই এম ট্রাই টু সাজেস্ট হি আর দ্য টি এস এলিয়ট রোট মেটাফিজিক্যাল পোয়েটস the essay in this particular essay eliot mentioned that j problem gulo that the particular you know the points that samuel johnson remarked regarding the failures and the drawbacks of the metaphysicals the same problems can be classified can be found in samuel johnson himself he wrote that and from them we can find that eliot wrote that in the metaphysicals a kind of unification of sensibility i am quoting eliot a kind of unification of sensibility can be observed what is unification of sensibility the sense and ability eliot wrote some people or some poets simply thought they never felt and some of them simply felt and never thought the problem is in the heart and brain you see eliot pointed out that if we think about the neoclassicals the neoclassical only thought they never felt and if you think about the romantics the romantics only felt they never thought so this particular coordination was completely broken and eliot pointed out it was only the the metaphysicals where the dissociation separation of sensibility was not to be present rather in them we can identify a kind of unification of sensibility that means if you go through the poems of the metaphysicals at one point you will find that it was completely being you know associated with feeling and emotion at another point you will find that the emotion or feeling it was 
structured stylistically. That means the thought, the originations of thought, the craftsmanship, the styling, all these things have to be present there. That was significantly what Eliot considered that in metaphysical poetry, we can find the basic resurgences of Jules Lefort, Baudelaire, Racine. That means it, it came later, obviously. But ultimately, we can find the same temperament that was actually originated and anticipated by the metaphysicals. That means the French symbolist, as I mentioned. He also found that some of the poets of the modern period, now at the time of Eliot, when Eliot is writing modern period, that means it actually originated the Victorian period. He could identify there are some, some, some references of writers like Lord Tennyson and others uh, who can be related with the metaphysical to some extent. And to be specific, when today we read Eliot's writing, Eliot's poetry, we can also trace some of the features to be present in, in them, obviously. Now, to be specific, if we try to refer to the metaphysicals, I must say that the metaphysicals can be classified into two major sections. At one point, they are considered as the metaphysical love poetry. At another point, these are called the metaphysical didactic poetry. That means the spiritual poetry to some extent. You will find, if you think about John Donne to be specific, you will find that at one point, John Donne is writing his songs and sonnets. You see, the publication songs and sonnets, probably you have gone through the sun rising. Okay, it was in your syllabus, probably in the undergraduate section. And also Good Morrow. Good Morrow is in your sixth syllabus. I will come to that. And also the other poems that have been associated with the love poems, the love lyrics. The, the, these were published under song, songs and sonnets. So these poems are classified as, as the metaphysical love poems. You know, Marvel's Coy Mistress, it is also in your syllabus. At another point, at another side, you will find there is another particular segmentation that is called the metaphysical didactic poems. That means these are to be classified as the poetry that actually originated, that actually focused on the patterns of spiritual poems. You will get some of the poems were written by uh, T.S. Uh, uh, John 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 Dunn, and these were actually focusing on the spiritual forms, say uh, songs or hymn, H Y M N. Okay, there are ample reference of the poems that are named as hymns to be specific. Say, for example, if I say a hymn to Christ at the author's last going into Germany. Okay, and also there are other sections, the holy sonnets, the divine meditations, as due by many titles, oh my black soul, this is my play's last scene, at the round arts imagine corners. So these have to be considered as, or there are other sections obviously, Good Friday, him to God, my God, uh, in my sickness, since she whom I loved, death be not proud. So these are the poems that are considered as the metaphysical didactic poems. It is, I, I'm actually focusing on John Donne alone. Okay. And also you will get, there are other poets who actually wrote in this particular formation. There is a metaphysical didactic poem alone. So for example, there is uh, uh, Herbert. Okay. Take for example. And also Henry Vaughan, the disciple of Herbert, the caller and uh, the temple and also there you can get the there are ample references of henry vaughan to be specific uh, the virtue is there by herbert obviously and also the other other sections i do not remember this moment uh, at the time and if you think about the metaphysical love poems obviously that is actually dominating okay apart from the direct sections metaphysical love poems are actually dominating and that's why you will find that whenever we read the metaphysical poems, to be specific, in the syllabus or any other places, you will find probably that the most of the poems that have been taken in, in your syllabus, these are the metaphysical love poems, to be specific. Okay. The for, say for example, I, if I think about the poems like ecstasy or the flea that is in your syllabus, and also if I think about a valediction for reading morning, or maybe good model, okay, that is also in your syllabus. So everywhere you will find that uh, fundamentally that the love theme or the, the matters of love is always being incorporated in this reason poetry. But to be specific, as you can see, that uh, the pattern of love, you know, as I mentioned that there are different kinds of classifications that have been made. Say, for example, uh, if, I, if I think about metaphysical uh, love poetry, to be specific, you will find that uh, 
you know the, the the typical formations of love can be divided into two sections as i found what are the two sections at one it is called the the spiritual love at another point it is considered as the physical love now what kind of love is being propagated by the metaphysicals you have gone through uh benediction for reading morning you have gone through benediction of weeping you have gone through sun rising you have gone through the other poems written by john dunn okay now tell me uh, what do you think that what kind of love actually john dunn is propagating whether it is sun rising or in any other form is it the spiritual love that he is incorporating or it is the kind of physical love that he is incorporating what kind of love is there tell me so physical love okay in, in sun rising okay yeah uh, uh, okay in terms of sun rising okay any other answer any other answer do you say so would you repeat the question once okay actually i i am thinking about that if i try to classify between the patterns of love we find that there is physical love there is also spiritual love now if you have the full knowledge about john dunn's poetry if you have gone through any of the john dunn's poetry then tell me what kind of love john dunn is propagating in his poems is it physical so or it's definitely spiritual because it's metaphysical which means beyond the physical so it cannot be physical okay don't go with the term actually actually the term as i mentioned just now that it was not made for john john dunn okay it was a term made for uh, abram cowley now in the modern sense okay we are dealing with them but actually don't the actually sir physical love that's why uh, the sun is called anduli phool okay okay all are there actually uh, uh, the problem is what he is stating uh, uh, that is uh, I, I don't know what's the name franklin yes so uh, it is true that it is something spiritual and you are also right that it is physical the problem is that particular pattern of love affair that is being propagated by uh, john dan it is called the transcendental love you see okay it is not merely spiritual it is not merely physical the problem is if you go through the poem the ecstasy that is in your syllabus i don't know whether i will be able to go through the poems and do justice to the poem obviously the times are so short and the time constraints are there that i cannot go with them in detail if you go through ecstasy at the last part of ecstasy you will find that john john dan is propagating john dan is pointing out that okay the spiritual love is to be followed at the earnest true but it is not that you can get your spiritual formations by completely negating your physicality okay he writes that the physicality becomes a means you see madhyam ekta through which but it a gateway as if and through this particular gateway you can enter into the spiritual realm that means from the physical level it actually transcends into the spiritual level so that's why this particular pattern of love theme that john dunn is orienting in his metaphysical poems or in his poems these are to be considered as the transcendental love you see okay and if you go through the the spirit of german transcendentalism then you will find that somehow these are quite related to each other i don't know whether john dunn had the full knowledge about the uh, german transcendentalism or not but ultimately the way he is treating love theme in his poems the same category and same kind of classification can also be associated elsewhere that is the formations of the transcendentalism now apart from the patterning of the love affair that's why you you will find that that the problem is when you go through john dunn's right uh, poetry that's why uh, uh, he is actually stating that this rabindranath mondolius yes, when he is stating that it is physical and he is actually focusing at uh, sun rising okay the particular poem where it, it seems to you that uh, everything is the physic that he is incorporating but ultimately you will find that john dan is stating john dan is thinking that when we are that means me and my beloved when we are uh, that is actually the whole universe okay if you go through sun rising if you go through good morrow if you go through uh, the 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 valediction for being morning or maybe the flea flea is a very good example for that if you go through all these poems you will find the full knowledge you will find the the knowledge about the particular for fact that we are everything and the outside world is nothing probably when amra shob ar ke amra jekhane achi etai boro kotha 
বাইরের জগৎটা কিচ্ছু নয় যে কারণে কিন্তু যখন আর কি ওই সানরাইজিং পড়ছে তখন বলছে যে শাইন হিয়ার টু আস অ্যান্ড দাউট এভরিওয়ার দিস বেড দাই সেন্টারিজ দিস ওয়ার্ল্ডস দ্য স্ফিয়ার মানে আমরা যেখানে সেখানেই সবটা এটাই পৃথিবী এভরিথিং ইজ দেয়ার ইফ ইউ থিঙ্ক অ্যাবাউট ফ্লি ওকে নাও আই আই অ্যাম গিভিং সাম অফ দ্য एग्जांपल्स অফ দ্যাট আই অ্যাম প্রেজেন্টিং সামথিং ওয়েট এ মিনিট is it visible yes yeah, sir yes sir okay okay now think about the poem flee i don't know whether it is opening or not yes can i see it yes sir okay what is happening there you see it's a it's a flee and what's a flee matshiva say a mosquito what happens there roughly you will find that a mosquito is there and it is you know st- the, the string is there and ultimately when dan's beloved was trying to kill that mosquito then dan is stopping her and he says mark but i'm just making a fast forward reading of that particular poem just take a look mark but this flea and mark in this how little that which thou denyest me is it sucked me first and now sucks thee and in this flea our two blood mingled we mane prothome eta tomake kambeche ba sting koreche ebar eta tar pore amake koreche ba prothome amake korte tar tomake koreche ebong ultimately your blood and my blood is completely being mingled in it ar jokhon amar ar tomar rakto ta ek jaygay mishe jacche that actually means that it actually creates the universe in it So that's why it says, "Thou knowest that this can't be saved a sin, nor shame, nor loss of maidenhead. Yet, but it is not enough. Well, ultimately, it is not a kind of a sexual implication. It is not in terms of the, you know, a kind of a sin to do that, nor any kind of shame, nor loss of maidenhead. So, but ultimately, without making a sexual coupling." i can see i can feel that you and me have been completely been mingled the bloods have been mingled so that's why it says thou knowest that this can't be said a sin nor shame no loss of maidenhead yet this enjoys before it who and pampered swells with one blood made of two and this alas is more than we would do or stay three lives in one flea spear tinte life royeche ekhane where we almost nay more than married are this flea is you and i and this our marriage bed and marriage temple is so ultimately can you feel can you identify it is actually incorporating a particular kind of a intermingling of the two selves okay so that's why this flea is you and i and this our marriage bed and marriage temple is though parents grudge and you we are mate and cloistered in these living walls of jet though use make you apt to kill me let not to that self murder added be and sacrilege three sins in killing three the three sins will be killed cruel and sudden as to thou sins purple thy nail in blood of innocence wherein could this plea guilty be except in the drop which is sucked from thee so what is the guilt except that it has sucked one particular drop of blood from you yet thou triumphest and sayest that thou finds not thyself nor me the weaker now it is true then learn how false fears be just so much honor then when you yields to me will waste as this flea flees death took life from thee 
So ultimately, what we can find here in this particular reference, in this particular line, that the last section, you see, here, as the beloved kills the flea, the lover calls her cruel and rash. She has purpled her nails with the blood of the innocent flea. It has been completely being murdered. What was the fault of the poor creature? Except that it had sucked a drop of her blood. The beloved is triumphant and says that neither she nor her lover is in any way weaker for having killed it. And then it says this is perfectly true. From this, she should learn that her fears of losing her honor, that is virginity, through yielding to the advance of her lovers are false. Just as she has lost little life in the death of the flea, which sucked her blood, so she will lose no honor in yielding herself to him. So this is the paraphrased version of the poem. So ultimately, what I'm trying to suggest here, that with this particular reference, can you not find that ultimately John Dunn is referring to a particular kind of an intermingling of the two selves. And as I mentioned, Dan thought that when we are in mixed form, it is everything. And the outside world is nothing. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. That was the actual orientation of John Dan's poetry. And it is not simply in case of Lee, but also in other poems, for example. Think about Good Morrow. What is there? If you think about Good Morrow, what it says, let us read this poem first. Probably you have gone through the poem before. It's a good morning. That's why it's Good Morrow. It says, I wondered by my truth what thou and I did till we loved. That means before our, uh, our meeting, what we did. Were we not winged till then? So the lines are actually incorporating. The lines are actually focusing on the children, okay, who are completely being attached with her, with his mother or her mother for feeding, obviously, for food. It is actually indicating towards the breastfeeding. So I wonder by my truth, what thou and I did till we loved? Were we not weaned till then, but sucked on country pleasures childishly? So ultimately, we'll find the patterns of love it indicates. It is completely different from the country pleasures or the vegetative love that you will find here. Okay, that also being pointed by Andrew Marvel in his coin mistress. Hot snorted we in the seven sleepers den. I'm not going with the allusions that have been there in the biblical allusions, so old testamental forms. It was so, but this all pleasures fancies we that means except this one, that means the kind of pleasure that we actually get regarding the sexual consummation and so except this one all pleasures fancies be if ever any beauty i did see which i desired and got it was but a dream of this so that means you are non paralleled imparalleled rather right and now good morrow to our waking souls because we can feel we can identify what is the importance of each other we can identify the beauty that is enamored or enamoring ultimately. And now, good morrow to our waking souls, which watch not one another out of fear. For love, all love of other sides controls. That is the emotion that is being incorporated here. The emotion is actually controlling the other sides, or rather one particular, you know, one particular organ or maybe one particular feeling. It is controlling the other sections and makes one little room and everywhere. This is the line that I am trying to point here. It makes one little room and everywhere. That means where we are, the whole world to be. It says, continues, you see, ultimately we will find here that there are the topical references, topical allusions. Uh, there are the references of the explorations of the new countries and new islands and so. Ultimately, I, I will go with, with them. You will find them in your Wikipedia and there are ample uh, websites where you can get the paraphrase and other things. Here it says, let's see discover us to new worlds have gone. Let maps to other worlds and worlds have shown. Let us possess one world. So, see discover us to world. There is a map. There is a world. 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 Okay. Let us possess one world. Each hath one 
and is one. That is the significant thing. Tomar ekta prithi bi, amar ekta prithi bi. Duto prithi bi mishegi ashole ekta prithi bi. Shete ekhane bolche kintu. Abar shi ekhi dhoroner concept. Tatpor shete ki yaro aro shamne dikhe gotsche. Ki bolche shekhane? My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears. And true plain hearts do in the faces rest. Mane. The same kind of reflection is being there. My face in thine eye, thine in mine appears, and true plain hearts do in the faces rest. Where can we find two better hemispheres? Without sharp north, without declining waste. The two sexual implications sharp north, declining west. So without sharp north, without declining west, whatever dies was not mixed equally. If our two loves be one, or thou and I, love so alike that none do slack and none can die. So ultimately, it actually ends with the patterns of love, the love theme. As I mentioned that the typical formations of the love, I mean, you take Twagi Bolshilam, whether it is the physical or spiritual, it is both the I mean, to ecstasy with the Shisha Dictagan. Okay, if you go with the particular poem Ecstasy, you will find that towards the end of this particular poem, it's a long poem actually, last dictate, I mean. Okay, let us read with this particular section. Okay, this ecstasy doth unperplex. It is the ecstatic soul that it actually points out. So this ecstasy doth unperplex. We say it and tell us what we love. That means what kind of love we do love. We swear by this, it was not sex, you see. So thereby he is negating the possibility of sexual implications. That is, it is not simply a kind of a physical love to be specific. We see, we saw not what we did, what did move, but as all several souls contain. Now, from sex, it is referring to souls or mixture of things. They know not what. Love these mixed souls dot mix again and makes both one, each this and that. So that, that means actually there's the intermingling of the two souls, not only the bodies, but also souls. And then it continues. A single violet transplant, the strength, the color, the size, all which before was poor and scant, redoubles, steals, and multiplies. That is, whenever you are in love, ultimately you will find that each and every kind of beauty that is around you, these have been multiplied, they have been redoubled, and so. When love with one another so, inter in, in, uh, inter in animates two souls, that abler soul which then doth flow. Defects the loneliness controls, etc. We then who are this new soul know of what we are composed and made. For the atomies of which we grow are souls whom no, no change can invade. Again, you will find the same kind of orientation has been made that are souls whom no change can invade. That means the changeability, the, the typical formations of alterations that have been made regarding body only. If you think in terms of the love of the soul, then there is no particular possibility of any kind of change or alteration. Remember Shakespeare's poem? Okay. Love alone, all alone, no alteration finds and no nothing. There is there. The, the true love is is no times full. Love is no times full. The rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickles compass come. Okay. It doesn't alter when the alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. So that actually being stated by, by William Shakespeare in his sonnet. And the similar thing is there. But oh, alas, so long, so far, our bodies, why do we forbear? That means body take out to forbear. They are ours, though they are not we. Okay, it's not simply we are the body, but rather we cannot deny completely our body. We are the intelligences, they, the spheres. Okay, intelligences means intelligencers, actually, the planets and satellites and others. We owe them thanks because they thus did us to us at first convey. So the body actually helps you to achieve the spiritual forms that is being incorporated here. Yielded their senses forced to us, nor are dross to us, but allay. So ultimately it is not the John is negating the body. 
okay on man heaven's influence work not so but that it first imprints the air so soul into the soul may flow though it to body first repair you see that is the line so soul into the soul may flow though it to body first repair that means soul may be mixed with the soul but it first appears in the body as our blood labors to beget spirits as like souls as it can because such fingers need to knit that subtle knot which makes us man so must pure lovers a soul descend to affections and to faculties which saints may reach and apprehend so you cannot negate the sense because it can reach it can apprehend it can make you you know successful in apprehending your feelings else a great prince in prison lies to our bodies turn within that so weak men on love revealed may look love's mysteries in souls to grow but yet the body is his book that is the line very important line love's mysteries in souls to grow but yet the body is his book and if some lover such as we have heard this dialogue of one let him still mark us he shall see small change when we are to the body's gun so ultimately we will find that here in this particular poem ecstasy a very significant poem that actually focuses on that actually in, uh, you know gives us the hint gives us the reference to the intermingling of two bodies and the body becomes the means through which you can achieve the spiritual union and so it is the threshold which can be incorporated into the transcendental form of love that dan is incorporating here so uh, there is a kind of love theme that we can find here in the poem like the flee the good morrow the ecstasy uh another kind of love that is called uh, you know a typical frustrating love that have been pointed by john dan in the particular poem that is the twickham garden this is the poem the twickham garden here you will find the poem is somehow in a, the taste is somehow different okay because it was not written to addressing and more to be specific it was something different okay uh, what it says that is in in, in twickenham garden uh, okay it begins in this particular form let us read okay fast forward reading it's not a very long poem it's much shorter than ecstasy it says blasted with sighs so as i mentioned that this particular poem uh, this twickenham garden it, it is the abode of of lucy the countess of bedford from 1608 to 1617 she was the patroness of dun and dun conceived a hopeless passion for her hence his despair and frustration and the bitter tone of the lyric that is in the poem it is another kind of poem that has been in your syllabus it begins in this particular fashion blasted with sighs surrounded with tears so sigh and tear is there when we, you can find there is the reference to and more and the typical kind of love affair that is going on between the two ultimately there was everything everything different but now this particular poem is a poem of despair poem of frustration to be specific you know it begins blasted with sighs and surrounded with tears hither i came to seek the spring it's a garden as you say and at my eyes and at mine ears receive such balms as ails cured everything that means the to some extent what's what the as you say because it's the nature nature can give you the the healing regions you say it says that at my eyes and at my ears i can receive such bombs as ill cure everything that is the typical form of temperament the typical form of frustration and bitterness that is present in me in normal times if i can live in a close proximity with nature you can come in the close proximity with nature i can find that it can it can cure everything but but problem is that oh self traitor i to bring the spider love love ta hote traitor এটাই বলছে যে এটা স্পাইডার and which transubstantiates all and can convert mana mana you know mana uh, that is the the liquid the drink uh, that have been given to 
দা ইসরায়েলাইটস ওল্ড টেস্টামেন্টের মধ্যে রয়েছে এটা ওকে সেই মোজেস যখন ওই ইসরায়েলাইটস দেরকে ক্রস করাচ্ছে না ওই ওই পারে নিয়ে যাচ্ছে মানে সমুদ্রে তখন ও তো খুব খুবই ওরা ক্ষুধার্ত ছিল তখন আর কি গড মানা দিচ্ছে বলা হচ্ছে যে মানা ইজ দা কাইন্ড অফ ইউ নো নেকটার লাইক আর কি যেটা দিলে ওরা সবাই খুব শান্ত হয়ে পড়ে তাই বলছে অমৃত কেও গার্লে কনভার্ট করে গার্ল मींस বি আর কি মানে মানে আমার মনের প্রবলেমটা এতটায় মারাত্মক যে সেটা মানা কেও গার্লে কনভার্ট করতে পারে সো দ্যাটস হোয়াই ইট সেজ দ্য স্পাইড লাভ হুইচ স্ট্র্যান্ড সাবস্ট্যানশিয়াল সোল এন্ড ক্যান কনভার্ট মানা টু গার্ল and that this place may thoroughly be thought true paradise i have the serpent brought it's an irony obviously and ei place ta ke amar paradise mo hocche kon paradise even as you know that if there is the paradise there is the serpent paradise hole garden of eden hole shekhane serpent ashbei in the form of satan mane satan as the serpent we are it were whole summer for me that winter did benight the glory of this place and that a grave frost did for we these trees to laugh and mock me to my face that means if this particular place is not to be considered as in the spring time if it were uh you know winter then there was no such glory present the frost was there it did forbid the trees to laugh and mock me at my face but that i may not this resistless endure not yet leave loving love let me some senseless piece of this place be make me a mandrake so i may grow here or a stone fountain weeping out my year so mandrake root or maybe a stone fountain that i can cut the body ki rakam kan nache kat be shekhane bolte je he there with crystal files lovers come mane emon kan na kanbo ar ki ekhane the intensity of passion the tears will move to such extent they in future the lovers will come with some vials with some containers and they will take my tears with them so that's why it says he there with crystal vials lovers come and take my tears which are lovers as wine and try your mistress tears at home mane amar amar ta test korbe tumi that means the tear drop that you will carry and you will taste my tear and then you will try to taste your beloved's tear and if it you know in in the comparison if you find it is quite close then you will find yes the intensity of passion of the beloved is true so that's why it says that he there with crystal files lovers come and take my tears which a lovers as wine and try your mistress's tears at home for all are false this is a generalizing comment obviously that means all females are false okay the similar kind of incorporation has been made by john dan in go and catch a falling star okay in a song there also same kind of orientations have been made so it was a negative orientation as you see at one point if you think about john dunn's love then you will find that to how, what extent john dunn can use his conceits now in the negative sense this particular form has been created he says all are false the taste not just like mine mane amar moto taste je gulo hobe na sob false alas hearts do not in eyes sigh nor can you more judge women's thoughts by tears so women's thoughts cannot be judged by tears then by her shadow what she wears so it's a kind of a masquerade it's a typical patriarchal work as you see oh perverse sex if john dan would write these kinds of terms in the modern society then probably he would be in jail okay the feminist to data can probably so perverse sex where none is true but she but he is negating he is negating at the same time affirmating he is stating that apart from my my beloved that is the as i mentioned the lucy the abbot of lucy it's the countess of bedford so apart from lucy the others are perverse or perverted to some extent no, perverse sex where none is true but she okay who is there for true because her truth kills me as her feeling for me is true so that's why the similar kind of passion is being present in me and i can also feel the same and it actually propagates it actually indicates that the intensity of passion the pattern of love that he, she is holding for me it is also true so that is another kind of poem it is also love poem 
but the orientation has got completely been changed. Whereas the last poem that I have selected here, it is the valediction for breathing morning. It's a very famous poem, as you see. Probably you have gone through the poem uh, before. It's famous for metaphysical concept. Okay, there is a kind of a description about the lovers and so. Okay, uh, the two legs of a compass. This creation is there. The name of the poem is a valediction of forbidding morning, as you can see. And uh, what happens, you know, that it is addressed to John uh, and Moore, that is beloved of John Dunn. And uh, eventually, John Dunn was going for an outing. As you know, there was no particular possibility of telecommunications or mobile phone or networking or something like that. And what happens that when the outing was there being constituted, it was through the sea voyages and uh, the various kinds of dangers are waiting and and more that is the beloved was beginning to cry and john is writing this particular poem it's a forbidding moaning as you can see what done is stating it is also indicating in terms of the physical and spiritual love that is stating as virtual men pass mildly away or whisper to their souls to go well some of the sad friends to say the breath goes now and some say no so that means it is actually indicating towards the, the matter of death. The persons are virtuous. They pass, they die mildly and whisper to their souls to go. And then the sad friends are there along with them. They are surrounding the body of this particular person. And some say the breath goes now. That means you admit So let us melt. And make no noise. If we are virtuous, so we must not create any kind of chaos. We must not create any kind of noise. We must melt. No tear floods, nor sigh tempests move. Now, tear is being related with floods. Sighs is being related with tempests. No tear floods, nor sigh tempests move. It was profanation of our joys. Now, it's a typical term taken from Christianity. It was profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. That means, layman jara, jara amadir, a love and intensity, amadir passion, amadir quality, amadir quantity, kono kuchhi bujbena. We must not tell them what kind of love, what intensity of passion we do reserve for ourselves. We must not tell the laity our love. And then it says, because our love is great, our love is grand. And he says, moving of the earth brings harms and fears. That means, Jokonarki earthquake hoy. But it harms and fears. Men recon what you did and meant. But trepidation of spheres. Now, this trepidation of spheres, I don't know at the time of John Dan. There was any particular concept of plates, plate tectonic, the, the theories of the movement of the plates, different plates. The trepidation of spheres, it is not indicating direct to the plates, you know, rather it is actually indicating towards the different kinds of orbits of the planets and satellites. But hints have been given in the modern scenario, we can feel that it is actually indicating towards the plates, the trepidations of spheres. Though greater far is innocent, that means the big movements are there. You see, the diurnal motions of the earth and other things. Okay, but ultimately it is it is innocent. There is no particular problem is there. So when you think about the earthquake, there is some problem that is lying. But if you think about the movement of the spheres or movement of the planets and satellites, there is nothing, nothing problematic. So when we are thinking about ourselves, as we are greater, we are the more powerful and something, you know, the, the different kinds of passion that we do preserve for ourselves. This is somehow different from others. Dull sublunary lovers' love. It is actually indicating towards the persons who are actually associated with the physical love only, whose soul is sense. That means they are not thinking in terms of soul. So again, you can find, as I mentioned, the typical transcendental kind of love that Dan is propagating, it is somehow completely different from the physical love that is being originated and also practiced by the dull sublunary lovers. Sublunary means under the moon. That means the, the persons, the earthly persons. They are dull. They are 
Carl Sabnurani Lavarsa's love, whose soul is sense, cannot have made absence because they are actually being focused at the physical, the body. So that's why they cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which elemented it. That means the, the sole focus of the physical love is physical. So if physically they are separated, their love is also separated. Right. But we, by a love so much refined, that is our love is completely different from them. It is a refined kind of love that ourselves know not what it is. They both inter assured of mind, careless eyes, lips, and hands to miss. That means we do not care about lips and eyes and hands because we do possess a different kind of love, different orientations of love. Our two souls, therefore, which are one, though I must go, endure not here to breach. So, Amra Jokon physically separated, Hobo. The souls are not separated, rather, it's, a, it's not a breach, a gap. But an expansion, like gold to air within this bit. So here also you will find a particular reference to metallurgy. Okay, physics. As you know, that is the elasticity of gold is maximum. Okay, it can be expanded to such an extent that it becomes transparent. It can cover a stadium. Such kind of thing is being incorporated. So how can you think that a, a poet, a poet? belonging to literature alone. He can state something related to geometry in the next part and metallurgy and physics and chemistry here. So that's why, you know, erudition, scholarliness that is being incorporated here. And metaphysical concepts, the souls have been compared with the airy thinness of gold. So that's why it says thy soul, okay, though I must go into not here to breach, but expansion, like gold to airy thinness bit. If they be two, they are two so. So if you do not think that these are one, rather two, then these must have to be thought as the two legs of a compass. So therefore, compass means the geometrical compass. It says, if they be two, they are two so. As chief twin compasses are two, thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. That means in the two legs of a compass, as you can see, one leg is fixed and another leg is moving. Dan is stating that the fixed leg is you. Okay? And the moving part is me. Now, what happens that if you remain fixed, then only the circle will be made clear. And though at the physical level, that is at the surface level, it seems to be separated. But if you move to the higher level, then you will find spiritually they are united at the apex, at the top. So that's why it says that if they be two, they are two and two so. As steep twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. That means if other one moving, it is also moving a bit. And though it's in a center seat, why it is called a center seat? Because you know the movable part, Dan is moving, but the beloved, that is Anne Moore, she will sit at the home. So, and though it's in the center seat, yet when the other foot or other, that is the other foot, far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it and grows erect as that comes home. But if you realize, one of the three erect results. But a circle to complete it. So that's why it says, such wilt thou be to me. So you were just like that to me. Who must like the other foot obliquely run. Man, ami move korbo. Thy firmness, it will make my circle just when our circle is complete. And makes me end where I began. That means I can come to that particular position from where I have started. So, do you think that it is simply a kind of an explanation that Dan is making? No. He is actually stating that whenever I will think in terms of the love affair, you who will remain at the home, you will remain at the house. You must be fidel to me. You must be fixed. If you can remain fixed, then only our love will sustain. The sustainability, it depends on the fidelity. It actually depends on your temperament, your fixity. Okay. That is the honor, that is the thing actually we get. So some of the poems I have selected. And these are the five poems that I have make a have made a particular glance of them. Uh, so that is the the dance poetry. Okay. 
and apart from them there are also other poets who are which are in your syllabus go through them try to identify the poems and i hope this will help you certainly